Hello everyone, we are live. Welcome to episode 28 of the Gretsch Afternoon Drum Break. I am your host, Mr. Neil LaFortune. So nice to be here and it is a lovely day. It's getting cold. Winter is coming, but the drums are hot and the guests keep rolling on here. I want to uh, do a few shout outs and thank yous um, to some of my friends here. I want to say hello and congratulations to Lucas Von Gretsch, my, my dear friend uh, of the Gretsch family, on a splendid second episode of the Gretsch Heritage. It is absolutely phenomenal. Goes into the history of the company, how things progressed, and we're an exciting at an exciting time and can't wait to hear more. And I really love the history part, talking about this 137-year-old company and talking to uh, folks who support the brand. We had Steve Maxwell from Maxwell Drums and Forks Drum Closet, and we had the amazing Josh Safer, all the way from the Gretsch Manufacturing Company in Ridgeland, South Carolina. And you can watch Lucas's show. The next episode is Wednesday, November 9, or sorry, November the 11th at 1 p.m. And I also want to thank Fred and Dinah and Lena for today's uh, gift. I'm um, deeply appreciated. And I am excited. I am wanting to see if my guest, Mr. Daryl Green, is live. If you are watching, uh, Daryl, please send a request. And this is a gentleman that I've been wanting to speak to now for some time. He grew up in the Oakland area of California, but resides on the East Coast in New York City. I'm going to send him a request here about his musical journey and, and talk about his Gretsch drums. I encourage you to check him out at his socials, which we will list at the end of this live. I sent you a live request, uh, Daryl, to join me in the video, and we are connecting. All right. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. There you are. <laughs> you know, it's my favorite time, I swear, when I see pictures and videos of guests beforehand, and then I see them actually talk in real time and hear their voice. It's almost like we're there, and we don't have to wear a mask. Right, right. But man, You actually can see what people I look like. <laughs> I, I, I know. It's like, what's it? there you go. Man, look at this. Oh, I love it. I'm so excited that we're here. What have you been doing since live playing was shut down in March? Um, to be honest, right before that happened, I had a um, terrible uh, injury. Oh, no. I, I, I dislocated my toe. And so, um, <clears throat> so actually, I was on the road and everything with, with this messed up toe. And so when it happened, it actually gave me time to <laughs> let my toe heal, you know? Right. And so I was, so the beginning part of COVID, I was really kind of just healing, uh, which is great because I would have stayed on the road with a messed up toe. <laughs> was that the bass drum or the hi-hat foot? It was the bass drum. Yeah. Yeah. That, so. that, can't, that can't be good. Well, I'm, I'm, and it, everything is good now. Is it healed up very well? Yeah, yeah, everything is great. I actually I just did two days of uh, recording uh, yesterday. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, so, but I've been uh, we, uh, me and uh, my girlfriend, we we've been doing a lot of writing actually uh, during this the pandemic, COVID, and uh, working actually on a, um, I guess like a, I don't know you want to call it a pandemic project, but sure. it, it's just music and things that we've written you know, dealing with everything that we've been going through since we've been uh, locked down, so. Nice, now what's the instrumentation of this kind of music? Uh, we wrote it in duo, and we perform a lot of it duo, but we're going to um, record it probably in quartet format, which is bass, piano, drums, and saxophone and vocals. And when your girlfriend play, just let's just clear this up for our listeners. Yes, she plays, uh, uh, went woodwind, so she plays tenor saxophone mainly and uh, flute and other woodwinds, and also she sings. Well, wow, wonderful! That's really nice. I've never, I've never had a, a girlfriend that was a musician, and I think I kind of like it that way. 
Um, yeah, because I, I want to be the... <laughs> anyway, that's, that's wonderful. Now, when did music and drums enter your life? I know you were very young when you started playing. Yeah, so to be honest with you, my my first memories has always been in being in love with drums. Um, so they entered my life as, as far as I can remember. It's when I was born. Uh, I know one of my first gifts as a child uh, was a toy drum. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a little red, white, and blue drum that said Little Drummer Boy on it. And uh, I held on to that thing until it was just, my mom just had to throw it away. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um that was my first like real I just always been captivated by the drums period and um so I, I can't get pinpoint I just know one of my earliest thoughts and desires as a child was to play drums that's incredible I remember having a, a drum set when I was about four or five that they were paper heads and I broke them I think that day they were red and I loved that drum, but I remember in my head thinking as a four-year-old that these sound terrible because, they, <laughs> you know what I mean? And probably a little wee sticks like that, but um, that that's awesome. So did you have drum education or, or where did you learn to play initially? Well, initially I learned to play actually in church. Um, so when we was going to church when I was younger, um, I was just, you know, typical child and making noise, want to play with my cars and trucks while, you know, on the pew and everything. And um, it was before they had drums, so it was just a piano. And um, the voice, you know, voice and piano, the congregation and piano. And uh, I tell you, one of my earliest memories about music was that it was the feeling of uh the people singing together and how they would, you know, stomp and clap, you know, and just that it was a certain feeling in that that I never forgot. I mean, I've never, I can still feel it like <laughs> to this day, you know, oh. and um, so that was pre drums. And so then they got the organ and then the drum kit came. Wow. And now when the drum kit came, oh man, that just, I, I I was speechless because before my mom was always trying to keep me quiet, give me something to do. When the drums came, I didn't even sit with my mother anymore. I was just like, Mom, can I sit in the front and sit next to the drums? And I would just stare the entire service. <laughs> and so that was my initial introduction to like a real drum kit, you know, being able to see one live and, uh, and I will always ask the drummers, oh, could you show me something? Could you show me something? That's and at that, at that time, drums in the church wasn't, it wasn't as popular as it is now. So they were going through a different drummers, you know. And so finally, when they got the permanent drummer, I, I, uh, I said, excuse me, I said, um, could you show me something? He's like, do you know what these, do you know the names of the drums? And I was like, no. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, and so he taught me the names of the drums and showed me sticks and the names of the cymbals and all these different things. And uh, and so from then on, we built this relationship. And he spent a lot of time with me. Uh, and he basically kind of took me on as, you know, as his student and uh, taught me how to hold the sticks, my first rudiments. Wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, he would let me borrow things like let me borrow a snare drum wow and yeah. how old would you have been i was about seven seven years old like, did you learn traditional grip or did you play matched grip at that at that time i was uh playing uh match grip even though he played traditional but i was playing match grip and um i mean that was just mind-blowing for me you just think a little kid being able to take home a, yeah i was like six seven something like that and being able to take home a, a real professional snare drum and i me, i remember the first one was a ludwig super uh uh superphonic yeah and and then another one he let me borrow was a rogers dynasonic Ooh, nice yeah and so Big. these were like great drums and some like you know beautiful uh zildjian cymbals i didn't even have stands for them man i just take them home and hit them 
with my finger, you know. <laughs> but just to have, be able to hear them and feel them at home, it was just like, oh, man, I can't wait till I get a real kid. I can't wait because at that time I didn't have a kid at all. I, I basically made a kit with, uh, remember the Lego used to come in buckets? Yep. Yeah, so I, I made a kit with Lego buckets and oh. a but <laughs> This is a, so good. Yeah, yeah, Lego buckets, a busted drum head that, um, from the church, that bass drum head that they let me have. And so I, I built a bass drum using the head at the frame and uh, I used a big old cardboard box to basically make a circular drum and put a paper head on the other side. And that was my bass drum. I had uh, pie tins for my cymbals. I made a little hi-hat stand. And so those were my drums. And um, <clears throat> so when I could use a real part of it, you know, the kit to add to my little toy kit, that homemade kit, it was just everything. And uh, so I've always known I wanted to play. I'm probably like one of the few people that had that feeling, but uh, you, my, mom, my mom always tells the story. So I used to take this kit and I would set it up in a room and I would play, you know, for, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. And then I would tear it down, all the way down, carry it all into another room, set it up and play again. And you were yeah, I kept doing that into all the different rooms. And my mom's like, what are you doing? Like, what's going on? And I said, I'm on tour. I said, I'm on tour. <laughs> That's incredible. I've never heard anybody. Well, Anthony McKelly has a similar story with, with an early drum kit. But this is unbelievable. I almost think that it was better for you not to have a real drum right away, a real drum kit right away to give you some delayed gratification, something to work for, and something to spark that fire of playing drums in you. This is awesome. Yeah, you know, my sticks were, my sticks were, um, so, you know, I don't know if they still do it, but, you know, when you would buy uh, women's shoes back, back in that time, the heels, yeah. they had this little long plastic thing they would put in the heels, and I would always collect those from my mom and stuff, and those were my sticks. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, and, now, was it at the Cosmopolitan Baptist Church? Yep. Okay. Yes. So when did you start to actually play there? You were watching the drummer, and then what happened? How did it develop for you? So um, we were spending time, and, and he was, you know, showing me some things, and I would go to the rehearsals, and he would spend time with me, and I never really had a chance to play. I would play in rehearsal a little bit. And you know, you have different choirs in church, you have different choirs. So one of the older, the choirs, they were called the Voices of Zion. They were like the seniors, like the older uh, people. And the director name was Sister Woodson. I'll never forget her. She was like the sweetest lady ever. And I remember one time, uh, Gerald, that's the guy, his name was Gerald Walker. Um, <clears throat> he didn't show up, like he couldn't make it. And I'm just sitting there and Sister Woodson just looked at me. She said, could, could you play for us? And I said, uh, yeah, I can. And um, I got on the drums, man. And, and literally, that's why it was a little, actually probably a little bit before I was seven, like five or six or something, because I remember my feet, I, would, I was playing with my tiptoes because I couldn't reach the, fully reach the pedals. And um, that was the first time I played. And, and then... From that moment on, I started playing more and more and more, you know. That's amazing. Were you playing six eight things? Were you playing eighth note things? What kind of what kind of feels were you playing when you were so young with in church there? Oh yeah. Probably definitely six eight, uh like or well, more like twelve eight kind of things because we're doing more uh, you know, church back beat kind of oriented things. Um and you know, my feels at that time was mainly like eighth note feels and things like that. <laughs> That is that is such a, a great. Uh, let's let's go ahead a little bit here with uh, what is the young musicians program and um, what was that and who is Kent Reed? Okay, so now that's interesting. <laughs> that was a lesson for me because, um, like I said, at that time I was playing match grip, and even Gerald Gerald was a 
traditional drum, played traditional grip, and he was in the National Guards, and he would play all these marches and things. So I was really kind of getting my hands together with him. And uh, <clears throat> so when I, how I got into the Young Musicians Program was like this. So in the school system in, in Oakland, they took, basically kind of took music out of the schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going into junior high school. My mom was like, she wanted me to be in a music program because she knew that's what I love to do. That's something that I love. So the only school uh, in my area that had music for junior high school was a school called Bret Hart. And I had to go there to audition to get in. And the music teacher <laughs> heard me play and she was like, oh my gosh, you need to uh, go audition for this program right now. Wow. And so she made a call to uh, the lady at the time who was running the program named Marsha Jager. And they were conducting um, auditions actually at that time, at the same time. So my mom, we, we went up to UC Berkeley because it was located on the UC Berkeley campus. And I um, auditioned and audition was like five minutes and I came out and my mom, she was just like, oh my God, like, what happened? Like, that can't be good. You was only there five minutes and and I, and so then when they came out and they finally talked to my mother, they were just like, no, we want him, you know. And so I, I think just because of my earlier training with Gerald and playing at church, it really helped me to get into this program because I, I had a little basis of understanding um, of music about how to read and yeah. rudiments and <laughs> things like that. Uh, so the Young Musicians Program was an incredible program. Uh, drummers like Will Kennedy, wow. Willard Dyson, um, a lot of well-known musicians, Rodney Franklin, uh, you know, just tons of well-known musicians have come out, uh, come out of this program. And the program was for basically for lower, for inner city, low income families, for uh, gifted, talented children. Wow to get a chance to have access to professional training. Wow. So our teachers were professionals um, and we got exposed to like all this music, all this just different aspects of the culture at a high level though, like a very high level. And so Kent Reed was the teacher at the time when I came in. And so he was, <clears throat> and he still, he still plays around the Bay Area um, but he's, you know, uh, at that time he was with the San Francisco Opera and he did a lot of percussion and other like club dates and things like that. So very influential to me as, a, as far as getting into the professional world. Mm -hmm. um, so he helped me really tighten up my hand technique, my reading. I started studying percussion as far as like four mallets and Wow, you know classical percussion and all these different things, and and actually uh, studying with Ken Reed was my first um, exposure to going to a gig. Oh, right, I remember reading that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so he 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 brought me along. I learned about how to load in, <laughs> like the whole thing. Again. Loading in. Yeah, you know, loading in, parking the car, coming back you know, setting up the drums, get, you know, you got to get there early, all of these things. So it was my first exposure and loading in timpanis too. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. What, what kind of vehicle did, did he have? Must have been something. It was a, a minivan. Yes. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah, and I, I remember the gig because he had to bring a drum kit and some timpanis. <laughs> and what kind of music was he playing to have timpani and, and drum set? It was, I guess it was like, kind of like concert band. It was at a hotel. I remember it was like at the Fairmont Hotel. Oh. And one of those places like that on California, up the mountain, and up the hill. And we had to load up these like really steep step, steps. And uh, it was the quickest way because technically you're supposed to go all the way through the bowels of the hotel to get in. But we kind of just went in because it was the quickest way. But I just remember that, you know, and I was like, oh, wow, this is how you do it. This is how they get the drums in there. This is how, yep. you know, so. That, that, that is, that's crazy. And how old would you have been? At that time, I was in my early teens. So I was around like, like 12, 13 years old. Wow, what an experience. Now, I don't think you realized it then, or maybe you did just how 
invaluable that was. My son experienced that with me playing and it was normal to him, but other, I started late, nearly 19, and I, I learned how to load in by myself and all the other things. I didn't get to go with anybody. It was scary at first learning these new things as, as for the first time. Yeah, because I, I can't even imagine doing it without knowing, you know what I mean? Because I was able to see him do it. And actually, I actually, I was part of the help. So I did it with him and it, it just prepared me. So when I actually had a, got a, like a professional gig, I knew exactly what to do. Um, as far as, you know, outside of playing in church before that I was, you know, playing in church and, um, I was doing like, you know, I'll do a, a club, you know, club hits or something like that, but nothing like, you know, like, uh, you have to go in and you just get called to re like a session or whatever, any of those kind of things I, I didn't really do at that time until then, you know. Wow. And how did your education develop more with with Mr. Reed? Um, like I said, I, I learned more of, you know, not just the drum kit, but just percussion, like uh, classical percussion. And, and and then so from then on, I started playing in some of the local youth orchestras and things like that. So I was in two orchestras. I was in the Barrier Wind Symphony and uh, another orchestra called uh, YPSO. And, um, and, you know, I was doing those twice a week and uh, just studying like not just drums. So I was playing the church, the drum kit. And then uh, twice a week, I was going to play classical percussion and reading. And so it was just great to be exposed to just all of these things at an early age. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and also just the educators, they, they demanded so much of you. It wasn't like babysitting, like, oh, we just babysitting because their right. parents, it was like, they demanded a lot from you. And they, you had, they treated you as if you were a prof like you, <laughs> as if you were a professional musician. Preparing you. I had a, yeah. drum, a couple drum teachers that were like that, <clears throat> that didn't take any excuses. We have a comment here. Um, Drummer boy Tim said, and you showed me. Thank you. So I assume that he, <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. Now, I just wanted to ask you, um, were you reading piano music at this point? You, could you read melodic notation as well? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, when did you have time to learn that, and how did you learn that? Was it on piano? Yes. Yeah, so that was the other great part about the program was you just didn't focus on your instrument. You, everybody had to learn piano. Everybody had to learn chorus, you know, vocals and how to sing. Wow. And so we learned like sight reading. I mean, all of these different things, uh, piano theory, jet, you know, just how to get around on the piano theory, musicianship, uh, composition. I mean, you played in the orchestras, you played in the chamber groups, you played in the uh, combos, you played in the big band. I mean, you were just exposed. You were doing all of these things. And I grew up playing drums and then I moved to the organ as well. So by the time I got into the program, I was already getting around on the keyboard, but um, just to get that theory knowledge and to actually know, oh, this is a C and this is a, you know, a dominant chord and things like that. That was like, oh, that's what that is. Okay. <laughs> you know? That is such great knowledge. Someone just commented here, it says, sounds like college and it absolutely, it absolutely yes. is, you know, and again, at such a young age, that is unbelievable. Outside of the drummers that you knew personally, did you have any drum heroes? Were you exposed to, to any of the jazz cats, anybody like that? And had you heard of Gretsch drums yet? Yes. Okay. So I knew of Gretsch drums just because uh, from childhood, I was collecting all the drum magazines. Mm. I'd go to the drum store almost every week or every other week and collect all the brochures of everything and just stacks and just read them all day so i knew the latest of everybody's thing um once i got into jazz I, I i started to notice like wow all these jazz drummers are you know i would see gretch here and there but i started to notice like oh they're playing gretch kits and then or or they're playing love or slingerland i'm like oh okay because you know during the 80s 
you know, usually saw like, you know, Pearl, Tama, you saw like more of these you know, bigger kits. So I'm like, oh, okay. And, and I just was like, oh, okay. So I was aware of it. And then this is another thing that happened. Uh, when I was in a program, um, the program had kits and we were mainly playing a Ludwig kit there. And so one day the director told me, she said, I need you to go down into the pit and, you know, uh, get these instruments and bring them up. And I, I got them up and I saw a kit there and it was a burgundy sparkle Gretsch kit. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is the color of Art Blakey's kit from, from Caravan, you oh. know, the Caravan cover, you know? And I was like, whoa, it was a 60 round badge. And so I went to talk to her and I said, who kid is this? And, you know, she was like, oh no, that's our kid. And I was like, what? Why you am know? I playing those? <laughs> right, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, later on, come to find out when I spoke with like Will Kennedy and Willard Dyson, those were the kids they were playing on. They were playing on the Gretz kid back in the day. And so anyway, make a long story short, that was my first um, real exposure to Gretz. That's crazy. Did they sound amazing when you played them? Oh, yeah. Incredible. And I mean, that's why uh, still to this day, Gretsch is, you know, my favorite drums to play. Uh, I, before even signing with Gretsch, one thing I was doing is, you know, I, ha I had a Ludwig kit and a Pearl kit and um, I, will, I will always try to make them sound like a Gretsch kit. But like, you can't. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> You know, and I was doing all that I could, you know, because I'm like looking, trying to, you know, I'm still a child, you know, trying to figure out how can I get a, a kit, you know, how can I get a Gretsch kit so I have to save money and all these things. And and so the kit that I did have, I, I was like, uh, I'm trying to make them sound like that. You know, I'm trying to, maybe I can just get some die cast hoops or maybe I can get these heads. And I mean, you can get, you, can, you think you're getting close, but not until you get it, get one, and then you're like, oh. Yeah, there's something very special in the recipe. It's everything, you know, from the last few guests I've had, including Mr. Gretsch himself last week. I, I know you tuned in for some of that. And Paul Cooper the week before. It's that nice combination of those Jasper shells, the die cast hoops, the bearing edges, and the silver sealer, I tell you. It's very special. Man, my face is hurting because I'm smiling this entire interview, man. Uh, you have <laughs> such an awesome smile, too, by the way. Look at this, man. You just light oh, up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is great. Now, was this um, the experience, was this at the California Institute of the Arts uh, and, and yet a scholarship, or is that something different than what we were just talking about? That was different. So uh, CalArts, um, I went to CalArts for, for school. Uh, for college, uh, after high school, I went to, I got accepted into CalArts and um, I went down there, uh, that's in Southern California, Valencia. Mm. And um, I went down there after high school and that was a great experience too, because uh, just like YMP, you know, you got this concentration of all these young people that are playing music at a high level. And not just that, they, they love the music. And that's the thing I think that's important. You have to love the music. And so when I got to Cal Arts, it was the same thing, but at the next level, you know, and there's these people that love the music. You had great drummers and musicians and that, you know, that I've actually made some of my, I guess now lifelong friends there right. that, uh, that are, they are still out there in the professional world playing. I'm sure you guys probably see them around. And, um, but then we had great teachers. Like I studied with uh, Joe LaBarbera there. I would love to have Joe on this program. Joe is one of my absolute favorite drummers in the whole world. Oh man, what did you learn from Joe? Sorry to, to digress into that, but what, what kinds of things did you talk about with Joe? You know, I learned, I learned a lot about Joe I feel, from, from Joe. I feel like, uh, you know, Joe comes up through that whole era of drummers, um, you know, that basically come out of that lineage that comes out of Alan Dawson. Yes. And um, man, it's just, 
I felt like being there was like a, a, a refinement. Right. You know, and it was just like, it was incredible. I just felt like the, the, the things I had, you know, they, the, those are core, those are central, those are my foundations. But then once I got to Cal Arts and studying with Joe, and not only that, because you had the, the African department and the Gamelan and uh, Indian, and you had all these world music departments there, and I was studying with these guys too. And so I had all this information coming in, and it was just like, you have this fear, and then all of a sudden it's like explodes, and it's like wow. everything is just like bam. And that's how I felt. It felt like, wow, my whole world just opened up uh, musically, rhythmically, and uh, Joe was definitely a part of that, you know. Um, and then also, you know, the th I know you probably noticed this. The thing about Joe is, you know, he's very, very, very relaxed. Oh, wonderful. Like when he, yeah, the way he plays is very just fluid. And I used to just watch him. And I'm like, okay, how do you get that? You know, how do you get the sound from being so relaxed like that, you know? Right. And so... I was really checking, you know, those kind of things out, and and then just him just relaying information and the stories. I think I think a lot of times, uh, the thing about mentorship or studying with people, everything, uh, it's it's one thing to learn a technique and it's stuff, but it's also the relationship, you know, the stories that's being passed down. The spirit, feeling the spirit of the person, you know, all of these things are being transferred. You know, it's just not just the oh, you know, do this and do this, read this and read that. It's it's also this the spirit is being transferred between, you know, whoever you're studying with and, and that person, especially, you know, if you're fortunate to have that, you know. That's that's the intangible. That is right. I right. did that with Jim Blackley when I studied with Jim. Oh, wow. And Ray Riley, who studied with George Lawrence Stone and studied with Gladstone. Oh, wow. wow. And he was, the, um, he was 25 seasons with the Toronto Symphony. And so we talked all about fingers. And yeah, that was, they were very, very special in their own way, the mutual respect, but life-changing, right? And you had, man, you had an awful lot of education. And then you ended up moving east and going to the manhattan school of music why why did you go east because it's warm out, out west and <laughs> daryl why did you go to the snow please tell me <laughs> oh okay well i'll tell you this this is how it happened what happened was i was, I was studying at cal arts one of the reasons i went towards cal arts in la was because i was developing uh and while i was in high school i was developing a, a relationship with uh billy higgins Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I would hang out with Billy every time he came into Oakland and played. Oh, man. And so I knew Billy was in LA and a friend of mine that I was working with in the Bay Area, older guy named Khalil Shahid, he was like, well, if you go to LA, if you go to Cal Arts, you can, you'll be closer to Billy. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, wow. I didn't think about it like that. So that's how I got to, that's one of the, re one of my motivations for going to Cal Arts. And then, so on top of Joe LaBarbera, I was hanging out with Billy Higgins. And so ridiculous. Yeah, and it's like it was it was like surreal. Like I'm I'm literally playing with him in his living room. And I'm like, I'm just trying to listen to him. And he's like, no, sit down and play. Sit down and play. So, you know, um wow. that was another part. I would be curious to to hear a little insight on maybe some Billy if you have anything off the top of your head, anything that you took away from from what you learned from Billy? One of the things that I, I learned from Billy was you have to keep the music going. You know, he told me that, you know, he said, make sure when you're on the road and you're traveling, this is before I started really touring or anything, but he said, always have some kind of way to play music. It's not just, oh, you behind the drums, it's off the drums. Mm -hmm. So he would have like a kalimba or a guitar or all these little percussion things. And he told me all these stories about how him and Ed Blackwell, when they would be on the road with a, with a Ornette and they would drive across country and do all these gigs together, they would be in the car singing and playing, you know, these different instruments and quizzing each other, testing each other. And just the music never ended. 
you know, they just transfer from one instrument to the next. Oh, I dropped this one to go to here, or, you know. And so that was something that I really that I, I took from Billy, is that, and I still try to do today. I always try to have some instrument, something nearby I can pick up and just continue to play throughout the day. That is so key because as as when when we're out playing, us drummers we can't play music until we're at the sound check, and then we're usually just playing that music, and we're not. Right. It's like being able to <clears throat> to be able to go to the driving range before you go and play your round of golf, you know, to continue that. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Oh man, oh man. Can we just chat a little bit? What are the what are those beautiful drums that you have behind you? I see something there. Can we possibly have a look at what's oh, in the room? Okay, so this is one of one of my kids I like to play. Oh, oh, man, I just man. I just recorded with it uh, again uh, this week. Oh, they are beautiful. What, what, that's that super old Tom mount from maybe 70? Yeah, uh huh, like the late 60s, early 70s. I like that Tom mount a lot. Um, really? Yeah. Yeah, so this kid, is, yeah, this kid isn't that old, right. but um, the Tom mount is. <laughs> I, I I get them installed because I I I, I like them just because they're just so simple. Bam! Put the pulse in, sit the drum on. Isn't that awesome? And direct to shell, so to speak, right? What year? Right. What year and what sizes are those, please? Okay, so I don't know if I can. I'm trying to get this camera angle right. Oh, that. But, uh, oh, I love white drums. I'm sitting in front of. Look at those. So those are USA Customs, of course. Right, and these are like late late nineties. Oh, wonderful. Great era, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, I have a 14 by six and a half snare. Uh, now, this is this is, this is what normally like eight by 12. So this is a nine. 13, nine. No, this is nine by 12 I'm, or 13, 12, 12 by nine or whatever. Wow. 13 by nine. And <clears throat> that's a 14. Now, on this kit is different. This is a 14, 12. And uh, I mean, a 14 by 11, and then that's a 15 by 12 Beautiful. floor tom. And then the bass drum is is actually uh, 16 by 14. That's great. Yeah, so that's that's one of my favorite kits. I, I love, I actually travel with this one a lot. And that's the other thing about these posts. Um, I like them because it's simple to travel with. I, I actually, whenever possible, I take my drums on the road, so. Is that right? Yeah. And I remember reading back in the day in New York City, the 18-inch bass drum was developed because it could fit either on the subway or in the back of the station wagon when the, right. you know, when the band was touring and playing and maybe maybe traveling together in one or two vehicles. But it also has a great sound to it and very versatile. That 16 is, uh, uh, is some people might think that that would be so small. But in your opinion, how do you feel about that? I love the 16 bass drum. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the 16 um, because for me, I like the drums to sing. And I, I feel that Gretsch drums in general sing. Um, <clears throat> but the 16 for a bass drum, it it really carries carries that, that note that I like, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so between the 16 and the 18, that's what I use primarily. But I, I go all the way up to 24. I got 20s, 22s, and 24. So I love them all, really. <laughs> so, and, you know, I saw Tony Williams in 92 in Toronto playing at the Bermuda Onion, this great jazz club. And he was playing the big yellow kit, the 12, uh, the 12 13, 14, 16, 18, 24. And, man, he could play that softly or he could, you know, make the the, the walls come down in the room. It's, it's the player. So wonderful. Yeah. It's yeah, and I, I love, I love, I love, you know, all the sizes. I, you know, like I said, the 16 is great for portability, just like the 18. The 24 is hard to get in the car, so you definitely need, like, an SUV or something. Yeah, I couldn't get it in my Civic. There's no way. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but, I mean, all, I, I love it. But for what I'm, for what majority I play, I like the 16. And uh, that's what I've been using on and off between 16 and 18 most of the time. That's amazing. So let's talk about the Manhattan School of Music. What what transpired there? Okay, so after after CalArts, I moved back to the Bay Area. I was working a lot and, and things like that. 
And I just kind of came to a point, uh, a lot of my friends that I grew up with that were musicians, they all basically went back east. And, you know, New York is kind of like the mecca, especially when you're talking about jazz, you know. And um, <clears throat> they all like, oh, you got to come, you got to come. And I'm like, oh, I'll get there, I'll get there. And um, so eventually, I just, I came. I, I came out here to visit a good friend of mine, uh, Ambrose. And another friend of mine, Geechee Taylor, trumpet player. They're both trumpeters. And um, I was visiting them. And um, Ambrose was like, well, hey, you know, he was in school at, at Manhattan. And he's like, man, you know, you should come out. And I said, yeah, man, maybe, you know, maybe I will. Maybe I'll come finish up some schooling here, things like that. And he was like, well, you know, let's go talk to the director of the program. Wow. And so... I went to talk to Justin DeChocho. He was running the jazz department at the okay. time. Yeah. And um, he said, okay, you know, we're having auditions. Let's have an audition. So I auditioned and I got in and that's how I ended up in Manhattan. What did you have to do to audition? It sounds like I auditioned, did great. <laughs> what, no, what did you, well, I know you had been prepared, but what, what, what was in this audition? Well, in the audition was, um, you know, they want to check your reading, see see how your sight reading, see if you can play the different styles, you know, things like that. Or, you know, okay, well, play, you know, uh, play a bossa nova groove at, you know, at blah, blah, blah tempo. And then, you know, take a, uh, you know, 16 bar solo or something. You know, they give you like these directions, yep. instructions, and see if you know what you're doing and you know from from you know they're just trying to get a feel of where you at and i guess if you're it, would you fit into the program well you know right wow and how long and when did you what year did you end up attending uh manhattan school of music i ended up in t attending manhattan school when i was it was 2005. okay so I was I was a little older by the time I got there because uh, after I left Cal Arts, like I said, I went back to the Bay Area and I worked around there with a lot of people and just kind of just, I was just growing so much, you know, working with different bands, like from the jazz things, uh, gospel things, of course, blues, uh, Brazilian bands, Latin bands. I mean, it was just so many just different styles of music. I was playing in these different bands and groups. It was just... I just I was learning so much that I didn't feel like I needed to go anywhere, you know. So Right. So what really kind of drew you? Was it just the whole New York City being in that Mecca? Yeah, so when I okay, so when I got out there and I'm this is the real thing. So the the thing is I always wanted to go to New York because you have great players everywhere, but but they all if, if they don't live in New York, they usually pass through it, right? In some kind of way, you know, yeah. or they connected to it in some kind of way. And so I wanted to go to New York because most of the guys that I really loved and uh, I wanted to see and or study with or whatever, they were in New York or they, they frequented a lot. And so that was one of my main motivations was like, I want to play with these people. Like I want to, learn from like you know the master drummers the master musicians but then also i want to get a chance to get the experience of playing with them if i can you know you know while they're still here you know because everybody is, is up in age you know right. and uh so that was one of my biggest motivations for new york um you know that is that is amazing let's let's talk about the kennedy center like, how are you affiliated with the, the Kennedy Center? The video, the promo video that I put up from um, from your promo, you were saying that that was filmed at the Kennedy Center? Yes. Yeah, so we've been uh, fortunate. I, I have a group. <clears throat> I have my, uh, my, my trio, and it works along with uh, Camille Thurman. And uh, mm -hmm. so we have this band together, and it's Camille Thurman with the Daryl Green Trio. And we've been uh, just fortunate enough to actually do a few performances there throughout the last, you know, five or six years. So, 
It, it looks like an absolutely incredible place. And, and what other artists um, have you been able to play with over, over recent years that you wanted to? Oh, wow. Um, you know, Dr. Lonnie Smith has been one of the greatest people, you know, I've had a chance to work with. Uh, uh, Pharaoh Sanders was wow. surreal. <laughs> you know, yeah, Russell Malone, uh, you know, Cassandra Wilson. Wow. Um, you know, uh, I've actually played with, you know, cats like, I, I don't, you know, bassist Bob Cranshaw. Yeah. And Richard Wyans, the pianist. I mean, just, you know, I've been fortunate to work with so many of these, these cats. Uh, Wallace Roney, who was, you know, yes, one of my, my one of my heroes growing up, you know, and to come to New York and um, not only work with him, but for him to to him and his brother Antoine, they they kind of just took me in like a little brother, and so to 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 be that close and work with them and grow, man, it's what a blessing. Yeah. You know. Any any feedback from Wallace on on your playing at all? Because he's played with 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 Tony, as you know. <laughs> yeah, that might yeah, be well, scary. <laughs> well, the thing about Wallace was that was amazing. Was he was like a walking encyclopedia, right? Um, and uh, not only did he play with Tony Williams, he played with Papa Joe. Wow. Uh, wow. Philly Joe, Elvin. You know, uh, you know, he, he played with all these drummers, man. And he, Roy Haynes, uh, I mean, a whole list of all the great drummers. And um, not only that, he had a relationship with them. So, so he just had a lot of knowledge and information and, and the experience to go with it. So um, it was just an honor working with him because he could pass on some of that information that that he learned from them, and those are like you know, as a, as a drummer, those are like my heroes, you know. And so, you know, that was very um, man. Well, you I, have led a very blessed life so far, and you're you're not very old. You're just getting started, my friend. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Wow. What kind of projects were you involved or are you involved before COVID? What kinds of musical things are you up to? Okay, so I just recorded uh, last year, it came out early this year, a record with uh, Lakeisha Benjamin. It was a, a record, tri a tribute to Alice and John Coltrane. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, and that's a great record. I mean, it's a... a a whole list of icon uh, special guests and really one of my favorite records to date. Um, okay. And what's that just, called and where can people find that? You can definitely find it on uh, Amazon or, you know, any of the major iTunes or okay. music places. And um, I'm trying to remember the title of that record, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's out there. Lakeisha Benjamin, she has an all okay. white, it's all white cover. And it's the latest release. It just came out in March, March, April. Wow. And, um, and then I actually, I just got out of the studio today. This was a project we were supposed to record in early March, but COVID hit. Yeah. And this is a project uh, with the pianist Keith Brown. Um, and that was great. We was in the studio for the last two days. Um, and that should be coming out probably by next year sometime. Uh, uh, Camille and I, we we're working on a project. Um, like I said, the COVID, uh, <laughs> some COVID music that we wrote during uh, the, this whole situation. And we plan on putting that out pretty soon. So we're actually in the process of recording that as we speak. And um, we have that project and we have another project that we were working on before COVID, but kind of took a pause so but yeah so we've got a lot of different projects and then on top of that I have uh I have a quintet too wow and my quintet is uh with a, a lot of young cats that are in phenomenal one of them being Wallace Roney Jr. Wallace's son no yes oh. yes 
And so. Wow. And, and what kind of jazz is this? Is this kind of all over the place? Is this specific genre or is this of jazz or, or era? What kind? No, it's, it's, it's modern. Modern. You know, whatever, however you want to classify that. Um, it's a band and uh, all the guys are basically, uh, these are the, like the young guys coming up. They're all in their 20s. And um, they're great players, great writers. So the thing about the band for me is having them to contribute. Not only are you know, going to play my music, but I want you to bring in music too. Uh -huh. So everybody's contributing in this band, uh, not just playing wise, but compositionally as well. We had a comment here says the quintet is amazing from looks like underscore pros dot. <laughs> oh, yep. Who is that? Do you know? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. That's wonderful. I would absolutely so, love to hear that. Are there any live dates planned? Because I know sometimes there's there's a few live things that are showing up. I've seen Joe Farns, Farnsworth play some live things, people wearing masks. I think he was playing at Smoke. Um, any, oh, right. Anything coming up that way with you? Um, nothing live on the books. I know we have another stream. Oh, um, in December, like December 14th, uh, but that's going to be on a link. It's not a club or anything like that. Um, so nothing today. We did have some earlier in the summer, but um, right, you know, okay. We all just kind of holding out and see what happens. I know. I I I understand that. Same here. Um, if I wanted to ask you, what advice could you give an 18 year old? who wants to pursue music and, and be an active player, what would you, what advice if someone were to say, Daryl, can you, you know, be a mentor to me? Okay. So one of the main things I would say is, first of all, you know, just really put your heart into whatever it is you're doing. You know, uh, don't, there's no shortcuts mm -hmm. and there's no rush you know that's great so so you know take the time to learn every all you can you know so i I play traditional grip you was asking yes so i took the time to learn traditional grip actually i learned traditional grip from joe la barbara okay and so i took the time to learn traditional grip i turned took the time to study all the different grips so that's what I'm trying to say is take the time to really dig in to whatever it is. Uh, for me, I was playing jazz. I was learning styles. I was playing with different bands. So then we started learn playing with swing bands. I didn't really know too much about the swing era. I just knew kind of like bebop. Right. So then I started studying the swing era and then the things that came before that, like, <clears throat> you know, baby Dodds and yeah. all these kind of things. So, take the time to really learn the lineage and the history and bring it up to current. And then, you know, you have a wealth of knowledge to pull from, uh, not just whatever genre you're playing, but every style of music. Um, and so that's the thing, you know, like I, I believe like Duke Ellington says, you know, oh, they say, oh, what music you like? He's like, good music, <laughs> you know? And I, I love all kinds of music as long as it's good music, you know? Wow. Now, somebody uh, commented here. Des Thought says, Daryl plays with every grip, and he also owes me a ride symbol. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, and he's the best, of course. And I did want to mention to you that watching you play a little bit um, on that promo clip, um, I was I absolutely love your touch and your sound. You have such a nice, big, relaxed sound, and you were not playing even though you're playing some roll things between the snare drum and the cymbals and things, you had such a great control over the volume and such a, a wonderful tone. And um, yeah, an absolutely wonderful player. I remember looking at you on the Gretsch site, trying to figure out, okay, I'd like to have some, some guests that I don't personally know. And I saw you and then I, I did some investigation. I'm like, oh man, I hope he says yes. So, oh, Thank you so much. I'm really glad you did. Let me tell yeah, you, this, I've been wanting to interview you now a little bit, and you are absolutely so so great to deal with and 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 to to become some internet friends here, and um, and absolutely my pleasure. Uh, he says he also gets the most incredible sound out of the bass drum. 
that'll be five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I think we would get along. I like. This. We just we just recorded yesterday. He was the bassist on the project. He's one of the baddest bass players in the world on on the scene right now, and it's one of my favorites to play with. Incredible bassist. What, I mean. what, what's his name? Desron Douglas. Awesome. That's he one. just he, he just makes drumming. I mean, you know, you're playing, and he just makes it so easy. It's just like yeah. A, a well-paved road, you know, you just gliding across. There's, I love this there's guy. nothing like I play with a bass player in a in a in an Abbott tribute, and it, it is like the red carpet. It is so easy. I'm, right. I don't understand if a drummer can't play with this guy, then they have a problem on their own. Me... <laughs> exactly. So what does the future hold for Daryl Green? Um, we will see. Well, uh, but that's for, good. That's great. We'll see. You know, I, I have a lot of things I want to get to musically yeah. Yeah. on the stage and off the stage. I, I want to get some, I, w I would like to get some things going for the community, for the younger generation mm -hmm. to be more a part of connecting with the young, the youth, you know? And so those are some things I really want to do moving forward. Um, that is wonderful. Do you do you teach at all? Yes. And can people do virtual lessons with you? I guess that's kind of the only way at this point. Yes. In, are you actually in New York or where are you? Yeah, I'm in New York. Okay, so mm -hmm. you do virtual lessons. I think I'm going to hit you up for for some things. So. Oh, sure, yeah, sure, that, sure. That would be a lot. Yes. Me. Yeah, and I, I do virtual lessons. You can, you know, reach me on all the social media platforms yep. or email me at daryl at darylgreen.net. Awesome. That is that is amazing. I want to thank you so much for your time and for your energy and for your your wisdom, information. Man, Des has lots. He goes, Daryl is about to be the next Art Blakey. He's a great band leader. Needs to drop his next record. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Des. <laughs> Thanks, man. Daryl, thank you so much, my friend. I've been wanting to, to chat with you and I was so excited about well, being able to, to to pick your brain a little bit and to talk a, a little bit about your journey and I appreciate your time. Well, what, what, what you're doing is, is very important and on so many levels. And I wanna thank you for inviting me. And I, I wanna thank you for doing what you're doing because uh, you're doing, you, you're interviewing people and talking to people. Not, not, it's not only just connecting us, but it's also just, you just learn so much. You learn so much. And I, I check out some of your videos and clips and things like that. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. <laughs> Everybody has been so great and, and offers an awful lot and is going to connect with somebody that's out there. I've gotten messages from people I don't know saying, I don't know you, but thank you for this interview, and I really loved it, and it and it helped, and and that's the idea, and I I like to give back, as well, and I appreciate those comments. So, all the best to you, Daryl, and thank all the best you to you as well. well. And uh, I will definitely connect with you, and we will will chat about um, some lesson material, and um, we will talk soon. Stay tuned, everyone, next week for episode twenty nine. Is it twenty nine? The Gretsch Afternoon Drum Break. Take care, everyone. See ya. <laughs>